You know, one of the biggest things that drives me crazy about the mask is this. <laughs> Seeing people smile, because you can't tell when you just see that, or are they frowning, are they, are they smiling? But the biggest thing with me is, is I got to go to the dentist, see? <laughs> so I can smile with my teeth. Oh. So I want you to know, even when I have my mask on, and even though you may have a mask on, that I'm going to tell myself that you're smiling. So uh, let's stand up and worship. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again, I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirst and soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my Give it up for Jesus this morning. Good morning, everyone. You can be seated for just a few moments. Those of you who are guests with us, my name is Scott Bowman. I'm the pastor. This is Ryan Chrisman, our worship leader. If you are joining us live, we welcome you. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us in person. Those of you who are here, but if you're not comfortable yet, uh, those of you... Uh, who are seeing this, there's three different camera angles. Uh, that's what's going on here. And so we're glad that we have this technology available for us during these times. One of the things, the most largest comparisons they make is to the 1918 Spanish flu in influenza uh, that happened in the United States and churches were shut down in the United States. Well, 
thank God we have the internet now, to, well, thank God to a certain degree at least, um, um, that we can, you know, go live with uh, cameras and things like that online. So um, let me give you a few announcements this morning. Next Sunday is Acts of Harvest, one of the greatest things we've been able to do. Uh, it's been certified by the health department that we've been able to continue Acts of Harvest, which is giving groceries out to the community. And uh, because of the restrictions, uh, we only did drive-through Acts of Harvest uh, over the last three months. However, this Sunday, we're going to change it up a little bit. And since there's better capacities for things and outreaches, we are going to move forward with outdoor clothing uh, next Sunday at th from 3 to 5. Outdoor clothing from 3 to 5. So uh, outside, you'll see, uh, we'll bring all the clothing outside and we'll release cars uh, periodically so that they can go through those clothes. So we'll need a little extra help. Of course, that's all based upon weather, but from 3 to 5 next Sunday. Um, if you are able, please send uh, Debbie and David Boggs a... Um, a note or a card of bereavement uh, so that they can, uh, her sister Terry passed away last Thursday. Um, so be praying for them. They've had a hard time and, uh, and uh, Terry's husband and things like that. Um, uh, so maybe f make a phone call or send a text message to let them know that. Uh, we will have, we're going to go forward with the July 4th outreach. Uh, however, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, the way that the July 4th outreach, which will actually be on July 5th this year, uh, will be, we'll set up a big 16 foot by 9 foot uh, rear projection screen out in the field, and we'll show the chosen Jesus film beforehand, and then around about dark or so, or after dark, we will have a fireworks show. You'll see a fireworks tent going up in the corner of the parking lot. The reason that that happens is because they give us all of our fireworks for free every year. And, uh, and we have some uh, awesome people who take care of setting them off every year. So that's what's going on July the 5th, just so you know. But tonight, First Baptist in Lawrenceburg, there will be a tailgate worship. Ryan will be part of that worship service. And um, so that's at 6 p.m. And this will be kind of the same style that we'll do things for July 5th. But it'll be tailgate style. Everybody hangs out, socially distanced at their vehicles. But we would love to have you to be part of that tonight at 6 p.m. Um, so right now, I want Kim to tell you a story. Now, there's a little bit of a shock factor to this story. However, it's agricultural in nature. Um, so, and I want to take that and I want to apply it. And you'll see how I'm going to apply it. Maybe you won't connect it, but you'll see. Here, here we go. Listen to this. Okay, so Scott asked me to tell this story about um, we have a cattle farm and we raise cows uh, that have babies. It's a cow-calf operation. So um, one year, our cow, uh, number 20, she had twins. And um, so oftentimes when cows, cows have twins, um, the mom rejects one of them, and she did. Uh, so we had this little calf that had been rejected. Well, it just so happened at the same time, we had another mama cow that lost her baby. So we had a mom that needed a baby and a baby that needed a mom. But you just can't go, hey, adopt this baby. So, um, so we had to be creative. Um, I took, we took the baby calf that was dead, and we took the baby calf that was alive and took them both to the barn. And, of course, mom was chasing after her dead baby calf, right, all the way to the barn. And we get him to the barn, and I had to figure out a way to get mom to take baby calf. Here's the shock factor, So sir. in order to get mom to take the new baby calf, I had to cut the pelt or the skin off the dead baby calf. And I took the coat off the back of the calf, and I wrapped it around the, the, the new baby calf. And we used um, hay strings and tied it on to that calf like a coat. And then I had to take the feces from the dead baby calf and rub it on the back end of the living baby calf. And so I took that baby and then put it in the stall with mom. And I, can't, I can't apply that. I'm sorry. That, 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 <laughs> that went too far. <laughs> so mom was then able to smell her baby. She thought that that baby calf was her baby because she could smell that the coat smelled like her baby and the back end, that cow smell, also smelled like her baby. And so within 24 hours, that mom accepted that baby calf as her baby. So she, the baby lived and, and they were great. So. Yeah. <laughs> now beyond the shock factor of that particular story, when Kim told me that a few weeks ago, I, was, I just kept thinking about it, kept processing it. You know, t 
And if we were to put ourselves in that context of the church, how do we make the Christian community uh, acceptable to humanity? Well, we have to look just like Christ. And so Paul the Apostle actually picks up this line of reasoning, and he says in Romans 13, 14, he says, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you will not gratify the nature of the flesh. And so the idea is, is that if we can clothe ourselves, literally put Christ on so we look like him, we smell like him, we act like him, we walk like him, then the world would accept us because they're accepting Christ. They would accept Christ because they're accepting him, not just us. And so I know that it's a, a bit of a stretch, but I couldn't get that out of my mind. I had to share that with you, that there is this imagery that even Paul the Apostle uses of putting on Christ, clothing yourself in Christ. Let's stand and pray as we welcome the Lord into this service today. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can put on Christ, as Paul said, that we can take on the image of Jesus, that we are Christians, we are Christ-like, and Lord, that we would be acceptable to the world so that they can walk and live like Christ also. Be near, Lord Jesus, I pray. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would descend this morning and let your presence be realized. And Lord Jesus, that we could feel the tangible presence of your Spirit this morning. Be in the Word, be in the worship, and be with us, Lord, in everything we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the light.
are here moving in our midst we worship you we worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you you are here moving in our midst i worship you i worship you you are here working in this place I worship you, I worship you, you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart, and I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, who are healing, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you.
That is who you are. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, you are here for us. Lord, I thank you so much that we can come together in this place and that we get to worship you. Lord, help us to always point into your direction. And as we go in that direction, there's going to be valleys. There's going to be rivers to cross. It may be cold at times, but keep us heading your way. Lord, we want to head towards you. And we want to go through whatever we have to go through to keep going in your direction, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for being that light that we can see, that we can take that next step. Lord, we thank you for the ability to trust in you. Jesus, I just ask that right now that you be with Scott. You give him the words to say. Speak straight to our hearts, Lord. Lord, be using his voice to pierce our hearts. We surrender all to you. In Christ's name we pray. Well, when you think about our church and our family, we began in a rundown little building in downtown Brooklyn a lot of years ago, a very troubled neighborhood. We had a little girl, our oldest girl, when we began, Chrissy, and she was our pride and joy and just a model child growing up. But when you're in the inner city and the doors are open to everyone, everyone comes. She started to make some associations that weren't good. And the next thing you know, a wall began to develop between Chrissy and God, and then Chrissy and, and her mom and dad. Sin makes you a fool. When you walk in sin, the things you knew to be right, the things you knew to be true, you just, you just don't see it anymore. So as a preteen, I was in this private crisis that my parents didn't know about, but I was consumed with a need to be pretty enough. I wanted to be desirable. One Tuesday I met these two guys in front of the church. One of the guys I was very intrigued by because he was clearly a man of the world. He wasn't a church guy and I thought, wow, I gotta get to know him, but more than that, I want him to know me. This started a relationship which would bring us the darkest time in our home. Things got progressively worse like any other dad who loves his oldest girl. I tried everything. The more I tried, the worse she got, the harder she got. We'd hang out and I was just obsessed with him and the need to be loved. I got to the point where I was staying in my car, you know, staying wherever I could. I couldn't believe that I would go to those lengths. Come to realize I'm expecting a baby. You know, what do I do? So I, my parents sent me to a a home, a Christian home. At that point, <laughs> I had no choice. I had weeks to go, and I decided to, um, that when I would give birth, I would give up my daughter into foster care because I didn't know how I could be a mom because I was in such a terrible place. Well, Susie wasn't in foster care for very long because I, I needed her. There were a lot of women at Brooklyn Tabernacle that loved me like family. I needed a place for Susie and I to live, and I reached out to a woman named Lorna. And Lorna felt from the Lord that she should take me in. And one Tuesday night, Lorna was headed to the Brooklyn Tabernacle for their prayer meeting. Lorna left, and I did what I always do. I would pick up the phone and call my boyfriend and say, she's gone, come over. And the phone rang and the phone rang. 
with every ring, I just fell into such a despair. There's just really no words to describe. I thought, and this is what it is. I've lost everything, and this is it. I wanted to take my life that night. Here I had little Susie. I just went to sleep. I put the baby to bed and I laid down. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, a really dark image came into the room. At the foot of my bed is this dark image, and then all of a sudden, this bright, beautiful image comes into my room. This dark image starts to speak to this bright, beautiful image and says these words, I have Chrissy's life, and now I will have her life, and it moves over my baby's crib. Now in the natural, you would scream, you would run, you would try to save your daughter, but all I remember is just falling asleep. And so I wake up the next morning, and I felt compelled at that moment to ask Lorna to come in and pray with me. I started to pray words that I never was able to pray before. I said, God, help me to say goodbye to this relationship. Her tears streaming down her face and she grabs my hands after I pray and she says, Chrissy, while you were at home last night, your dad received a note and the note said tonight is Chrissy's night. And we were in a Tuesday night prayer meeting at the Brooklyn Tabernacle when a, a young woman in the church sent up a note. I asked an associate pastor who was there, would you lead out in prayer? And suddenly the church turned into like a labor room. And that's where we were. We were in spiritual warfare for my daughter. All I can tell you is that at that moment I felt free. I just felt free. I felt light. The first thing I wanted to do was to see my mom and dad because I knew that God had set me free. The doorbell rang and uh, I went to the door and who was at the door? My daughter Chrissy with her beautiful little baby. We went on into the kitchen. My husband sat in a chair and Chrissy came over. She knelt down and she said, Dad, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you, my mom. She says, but God came to me last night and he, he showed me my sin and where I was going. He came to me in such a supernatural way. She said, who was praying last night? Who was praying for me? And we went ahead and we told her that the church was like a labor room in prayer. And God broke through. That Sunday when I walked in the church, I'll never forget what I experienced. It was the love of Jesus in the most tangible way. When dad took Susie and prayed for her, and then at the end of the dedication, he held her up for the people to see, and they just cheered, and they were cheering for her, and they were cheering for me. You know, it was a really crucial season for me. I was at the church every Sunday. God was removing the thorns that I had put there, that my sin had put there. And little did I know that God was preparing me for something so much greater than I'd ever imagined. It's just awesome what God does when we give ourselves to prayer. God is extraordinary. God is faithful. You can't give up. It's always too soon to quit. What Satan meant for evil, God will work it for good. of the Christian message than that that depicts it is a life of ease with no battle or struggle at all. Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. A battleground, not a playground. I've known of that story for many years and then just recently see that they have done a thematic presentation of it and wanted to share that because it's the perfect entry point, I believe, where we are in this idea of the unseen realm. Now, maybe it's absolute irony, but three months ago, as we were kind of heading into this season of pandemic, we didn't know it, of course, we had begun this series on the unseen realm. I was grieved at the fact that we couldn't continue it uh, like we were, 
uh, because I feel like we were really getting some traction. And so the irony that happens here is, is that what we noticed three months ago is, is that Jesus was doing some smack talk, basically, to the gods of the nations, putting them on notice that he was about to take the nations back to himself. You have to put this all in context of the book of Luke. We see that in Luke, Jesus goes into the desert, and Satan tempts Jesus and says, I'll take you up to the pinnacle of the temple, and I'll show you all of these nations, and I'll give them back to you. Obviously, this implies, one, that the nations were not Jesus at this point, but they were the god of this world's, Satan's. He owned them, if you will. However, Jesus refuses him and says, no, nah, it's not going to happen that way. Immediately after this story, we begin to see that Jesus was uh, with the disciples, and he went to what is called in, still in Israel, it's called at the foot of Mount Hermon, the gates of hell. And there Jesus asked the disciples, whom do you say that I am? And Peter confesses. You know the story well at Caesarea Philippi. He confesses, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Flesh and blood is not revealed to this to you, Peter, but my father in heaven. Do you see the war that's happening of the revelation of God to humankind? And so there at the foothills of Mount Hermon, Jesus is confessed as the one true God, that he is God in the flesh. Now, the midst of the pagan temple worship that you have at that foothills, there was a massive altar and a temple to the Greek god Pan. And so, if you want to put this in historical context, you have to realize that the Greek god Pan would have goats sacrificed to it. It was half man, half goat. He had cloven hooves and a goat-like lower body while being man atop. And it was said that uh, in uh, Greek mythology and Greek uh, religion that Pan would actually have the power to go into the cities at night and terrorize people. That's why it's called panic, panic, meaning that we use that word today because it's based on that story of history. And so you would sacrifice a goat at that temple, throw it into what was called the gates of hell, a massive cave-like opening where the waters of actually uh, would come up out of the cave. And so they thought that that was a way into the underworld and that the gods were down there. And so you would throw the sacrifice goat into the waters, and if it sunk, then Pan accepted your, your sacrifice. If it floated, then it wasn't, sacrifice, it wasn't accepted, and you had to go do it all over again. It's quite a picture that's happening here. And so then you see that after Jesus is confessed as the Christ, as the king of the universe, basically, Jesus walks up onto the mountain, and then, you know this from Scripture, is transfigured. He is lifted up from the earth, and he's transfigured on top of Mount Hermon, and he is dazzling white. And at that moment, Jesus has just put all of the gods, lowercase g, on notice that he's about to take back all the nations, whether Satan likes it or not. This is the reality of the unseen realm, folks. And we need to recapture, I believe, the spiritual nature of the scriptures themselves, because in the Western world, we've lost it. This is a battle, folks. This is not a game. This is real. And we are battling in the spirit for souls that have been captured by the enemy. So the irony, I believe, is, is now that as Jesus is lifted up, ultimately lifted up on the cross, now Pan is in panic himself because he knows he's about to lose. So Luke has us imagine, beginning in chapter 10, we just kind of recapitulated Luke chapter 9, if you will, and the travels of the 70 begin to happen in, 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 uh, in chapter 10. And Jesus sends out the commissioned and the empowered ones. He chooses 70 and he sends them out to do his ministry. And now they've returned and they're beginning to report back. That's where we're going to enter the scripture today. So let's go back in time. Enter into the text and read with me. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. Luke 10, 17 through 20. It says this, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. 
Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the book in heaven. Father, I pray that you would bless your word, that you would anoint it to go forth for us to hear, to accept it, to understand it, and Lord, that you would explode your word before our eyes so we can know how to live this Christian life, we pray in Jesus' name. Now, I think it's interesting here that we see the outworking of Luke chapter 9. Jesus is transfigured. All of this happens at Caesarea Philippi. And so the outworking of that is is that uh, Jesus putting the gods of the nations on warning, sending out the 70. Now exactly what Jesus did at, at the temple of Pan at Caesarea Philippi, warning the gods of what's going to come. Then we see at the Mount of Transfiguration the triumph that Jesus is getting ready to take them back. And so now he begins to commission 70 to go out into the world and do the same exact thing Jesus did on a multiplied level. This is what the church does. It goes out into the world to take back what the enemy has stolen and advances the kingdom of God into the darkest places on earth. And this is what you see the church doing everywhere, pushing to the edges and the corners of the darkness where the darkness meets the light. That is the missional edge of the church. Because in the statement Jesus makes, he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You see, you have to realize that the gates of hell are a defensive mechanism, not an offensive weapon. That means that the kingdom of God is the aggressor, not the gates of hell. That means that the church itself has seen it as a missionalized entity that goes into the world to push back and to literally rattle the gates of hell. That's what the church is. And we're taking back things that the enemy has possessed in his past. I love in that video, she said, that night I wanted to take my life. But that's not what happened, was it? Jesus took her life. Do you see the contrast there? I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. He said, prayer is not a preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. Jim Cimbala, the pastor in that video, said that 30 minutes of spirit-led prayer is more effective than all new programs, stylistic changes, and any other human ingenuity. Nothing we do in our own efforts holds a candle compared to the power of God. When are we going to get this in the Western world? When are we going to get this in the church? That we can toil all day long. This was the entire background of why we did sabbatical before we came back into church. We can't do it, but Jesus can. So I'm going to spend time resting in God's will rather than wearing myself out because I can't do it what only God said he could do. He said, I will build my church. He didn't say Scott or Ryan would build the church or anybody else or the board or New Harvest would build the church. He said, I, Jesus, will build my church. There's an old story about a man who recounted experience about he was watching at the zoo. You may have heard this story before, but it bears repeating. So the story goes like this, that he was watching this wild cat. You could tell that it was a little bit older of a wild cat sitting in its cage, pacing back and forth. And all of a sudden, a door from the back of the cage opened, and a man walked in, and he just had a broom. And he's in the cage. He's just sweeping around. And, and this man is watching this all happen, and he's thinking, that wild cat is going to jump on that man that only has a broom to defend himself and going to attack him. And so finally he calls out to the man and he says, Sir, you must be very brave to get in there with that wild cat. He says, Oh no, I'm not brave. He says, Well, that cat must be tame if you're in there with only a broom. He says, Oh no, that cat's not tame. He's as wild as he would be in anywhere else. He says, Well, then why do you have enough boldness to walk into that cage alone with just a broom? He says, It's because he's old and he doesn't have any teeth left. This is exactly the understanding of Satan. This is why Jesus says that he may bruise you up a little bit, he may gum at you a little bit, but he can't do anything to you in the end. Satan has no ability to touch your soul. 
because it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't forget, Satan is old and doesn't have any teeth. And we begin to hear the echoes of the Old Testament here. In Genesis, we see that Satan will bruise the heel of the offspring of men. But one man will crush the serpent's head. Satan can gum you, he can bruise you up a little bit, but he cannot kill your soul. Jesus already crushed his head and took away his teeth. And very soon, he's going to finish the job. Amen? So Jesus says in verse 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. Nothing will injure you. That is not just a divine right or a principle of the church. That is a missiological call to go forward and not be afraid of the enemy when we're going in the dark places to take back what the enemy has stolen, folks. And we see this thread emerging of the book of Luke following into Acts. And it's the spirit empowerment of Luke in, in Jesus, in the Gospels, and it flows to the disciples. And then in the book of Acts, there is this cataclysmic shift that we see. Just at the beginning of Acts, Jesus promises that something is going to happen that you need to hang out in Jerusalem for before you go anywhere else. Before the kingdom of God begins to rattle the gates of hell, you need to wait for this one thing. And that we know in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 was the power of the Holy Spirit coming. And this becomes the reversing power of the Holy Spirit. This cataclysmic shift we see at Jesus' spirit baptism comes, and then it becomes Jesus' spirit's ministry empowerment that's given to the disciples. And then after Acts chapter 2, you see them going everywhere in the known world, spreading the gospel and taking back everything, the nations that have been stolen. And they're going about doing good everywhere that they go, healing the sick and preaching the gospel. Who does that sound like? It's Jesus' ministry. It's Jesus' ministry. If we're going to model our church on anything, it needs to be on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, the outworking of that. There's there's something I just got to say. I just finished a class on biblical interpretation. You have to realize... That everything Paul the Apostle wrote, all of the epistles, which a lot of churches focus on, and I'm not criticizing anybody, I'm just saying there's a Paulology in the United States. Everything Paul wrote was in light of the Gospels of Jesus Christ. You have to realize that. You have to read everything, I believe, from the lens of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 of Pentecost and see what it meant through That scripture, through the spirit-empowered people. Don't read Paul by himself. Read Paul in light of Jesus. Because everything Paul wrote was an outworking of what Jesus was saying to the church. And so the truth is, is we see this cosmic battle of the unseen realm that's being fought by Jesus and his church. And it has some history to it. It began at the beginning of time. In the book of Genesis, we read that Eve's conflict was with the serpent in the garden, right? And we feel this inkling of the connection between Jesus telling the 70 that they can tread on serpents without harm. And the truth is is that Adam and Eve were facing total and utter failure in the garden. Anybody ever failed in life before? You ever been there before? That's the book of Genesis. Human failure. One right after the other. You can see it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, that is pretty much human failure and God trying to clean up the mess that humans made, right? (laughs) Anybody feel like that's a a little picture of your life today, (laughs) right? Okay, I remember personally uh, that maybe the small pericope or a small uh, concentrated area of this in my life, uh, I was playing softball in college one time. I was not in like an organized level, just like a league with friends. And uh, they had the t-shirts made and I was working out in the gym a lot at that time. And uh, I'm like, I'm going to put bruiser on the back of my jersey. That's what I'm going to do. And I get up there the first time. Everybody's watching. And I got bruiser on the back. And, I, and I, had the, I had the guns to match it. You know what I mean? The looks, anyway. 
I struck out the first pitch. You know what I mean? The, struck out. I get up the bat. I swing as hard as I can like I'm hitting a fastball. It's a softball. You can't swing that fast. You know what I mean? Struck right out. That's exactly the failure that Adam and Eve had in the garden. <laughs> we got this. And then we fail utterly before everybody, all of the nations watching this. So in Genesis 1.26, humanity was supposed to rule over the created wild animals of the field. And the contrast is, is that humans are unlike creatures of the field. And they were designed to reflect the image of God. Animals don't do that, folks. And we are gendered specifically for procreation and mutuality and co-creation and co-nurturing the earth as part of God's design. However, what we see, the problem with that is, is that we see a serpent, a lowly serpent of the field dominating humanity. And God's order is flipped in the book of Genesis. And we have a problem that we have to deal with at this point. But now the scripture in Luke is a reversal of the backwards order. Jesus sends out the 70 and said, you can tread on serpents. Anything that the enemy can throw against you, you can crush underneath your feet. Do you see the empowerment, the reversal that Jesus is bringing? Serpents, scorpions, whatever deadly poison the enemy can give to you or try to harm you with, it's not going to work. And you may be sitting in your, your home, you know, your home if you're with us online, or you may be sitting in this church realizing that there are some people in your life right now who are spewing poison at you. They're saying things behind your back. They're talking about you. Listen to me. It doesn't matter. Jesus has already triumphed over every poisonous thing the enemy can throw at you. And you would be sort of uh, ignorant to think that the enemy doesn't just come to you in a spiritual form, maybe like Chrissy talked about, but he comes to you in human form too. He masquerades, the scripture says, like an angel of light. He's going to do everything he can to try to deceive you into thinking that he should be first in your life. But Jesus needs to be the first. Keep this in mind also, that you are covered by the blood of Jesus. And it's the son's blood that causes you to no longer be tread on by the enemy because he has triumphed over the enemy on the cross. And this is essentially the gospel, folks, the reversal of the fall of humankind. The serpent had been trampling on us, but now we trample on the serpent. The kingdom of God has come near and reversed the curse of sin. And I'm proclaiming to you today that the gospel that Jesus is working in your life right now. And he is Lord over the overwhelming chaos and disaster and disorder of your life and everything in the world today. You can look for about three seconds at the political sphere or the nations of the world that are raging or the dictators that are uh, speaking, and they are right now, and know that among all of the disorder, the kingdom of God has come into your heart, and he's reordering you first because he's getting ready to reorder the nations to their end. And that is the power of the kingdom of God, of the church going forward to change everything. God wants to change not just you. He wants to change your problems at work. He wants to change the problems in your family. He wants to change the frustrations and the disorder that go along with everything that the enemy has tried to take from you. And he wants to reverse it, flip it on its head, and take it back. Now, this being the case, Jesus reminds us, don't get too hung up on the fact that you can triumph over the enemy. He says there's something better. Look at verse 20. He says, nevertheless, that means I realize that I just told you you can tread on serpents and scorpions and you have, the enemy has no power over you. He can bruise you up a little bit, but he can't kill you. Don't worry about it. He says, but, but, and believe me, they were on a spiritual high. They had just cast out demons. That's a spiritual high, okay? He says, but, 
Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Jesus wasn't rebuking or nominalizing the marvel and the ministry that they're going through. Rather, he's saying, your rejoicing is misplaced here. It's not that spirits are subject to you because of what Jesus has done. It's more that your names are written in heaven. And you have to see the nuance of the contrast Jesus is making. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Satan comes down to earth. He falls from heaven. But your names go from earth into heaven. And now they're written in heaven. And that is the contrast Jesus is making. It's not about the spirits being subject to you. It's about your names that have been transferred from here, the temporary, into the eternal realm. And that one day you will reign with him. That is the contrast Jesus is making. There is no question here. Jesus is taking back the nations, and he's using his church to do it. I think there's so many ways that we can imagine the outworking of that particularly. There are businesses, I pass one every day in Lawrenceburg, that I wish would just crumble under the weight of their own sin. There are edifices built to pagan things, not the least of them, the God of money, the gods of power that exist in this world. There's so many ways that I think we can see the indicators of where the enemy's working. Poverty is one of them, a sickness, disease. And we can see how the kingdom of God can come and the church can be the missional agent of Christ in the world to reverse everything that the enemy has done. To ultimately bring about the kingdom of God and his reign. There's no question here. Jesus is taking back the nations. But the most important thing to remember is is that Jesus has taken back your soul. If you've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today and you believe in him, your soul's his and nobody else's. It's not your own. It's not the enemies. It's not your friends. It's not your spouses. Your soul belongs to the Lord. Maybe you've never done that or you've done it in the past and you haven't been living right. You haven't been living like God has called you by name. Or transferred your name into the kingdom of heaven. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Maybe it is just because of the frustrations that we experience in the world today. And I'm sure there were frustrating times in the past. Don't get me wrong. I can't imagine. I was thinking for some reason about the, what, it, what life would have been like in the 1920s and the 1930s leading up to the Great Depression after the Great Depression. At least for our context in the United States. And I would imagine believers thought the end of the world is near. It's coming. For a hundred and some odd years, Pentecostals have always believed Jesus was getting ready to return at any moment. And we've always lived like it. We've always been ready. We've always been waiting for the return of Jesus. Whatever it is, I just feel an urgency in my spirit. Today's the day. Now's the time. Stop waiting. Stop floundering. Stop asking. Just do it. There's only one way you're really going to find out, folks. And that's to actually voice the words, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I've tried it every other way, every other avenue I've tried. But this time I'm going to call upon your name to deliver me. This time I'm going to call upon your name 
to fix my problem. And I'm not talking about the world's problems. I'm talking about me. Can we pray this morning? Jesus, I just ask that you would just move upon your church this morning, both here and abroad, both here, Lord Jesus, in this context, in our building, but also, Lord Jesus, those outside the walls that are not here with us this morning. Lord, I pray that this church, New Harvest, could be the missional edge of what's happening. Send us, Lord Jesus, in the dark places so that we can light the place up, Lord, with the power of the Spirit. We can't do it alone, but I pray that you would give it us imaginative ideas, ways, Lord Jesus, to see the unseen so that the powers and the principalities and those things that are work, like Ephesians says in dark places, the battle against flesh and blood can be won but I know Lord it doesn't go down without a fight let us put on the armor of the Lord and live this life let us put on Christ to live this life so that the world can see you let me speak to those that are online this morning and in the building If you felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit that this is the time that you want to give your heart to the Lord, I want to pray with you right now. Let's pray this prayer. Everybody here at New Harvest is going to pray with you this morning. Lord, we ask that you would come into my life. Change me. I'm tired of the old way. I want to try the new. Your new way. For you are the way the truth, and the life. Father, come to me by your Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sins and my past and let my future be lived to you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you're online this morning or in the house and you prayed that prayer, please message us or send us a comment or something like that so that we can follow up with you and get you deep into discipleship here at New Harvest. We don't want you to just give your heart to the Lord, and that's it. Jesus said to go and disciple the nations, not just pray a prayer with them and get them saved. So we'd love to meet you in person or online so that we can begin the process of discipleship. That goes for everybody in this building, too. We appreciate you for being with us today. Remember that 6 p.m. tonight, we will be having the tailgate worship service at First Baptist Church in Lawrenceburg. We'd love to see you out there. Though maybe distance, we'd love to see you. And uh, let's see the church out in the world. Amen. Amen. Let me bless you as you go. Father, I pray that you would bless us, that you would keep us, that you would turn your face towards us, that the light of the glory of your face would shine upon us, that you'd be gracious unto us, Lord, I pray, and that you would give us your peace. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for the empowerment that you give to all believers. And, Lord, we thank you more than anything that our names are written in heaven. Where no one can steal them, where no one can erase them or attack them, but they're safe and secure in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. It's going to be a beautiful 72 degrees high day like we're living in San Diego here, folks. Don't forget to thank the Lord for that. God bless you. We'll see you soon.